On behalf of the Professional Baseball Strength and Conditioning Coaches Society, I'd like to welcome you to the PBS CCS podcast. I'm your host, Chris Messina. Casey Callison of the Toronto Blue Jays organization. Casey, thanks for coming on, man. Appreciate your time. Tell the listeners about yourself, if you would, please. Sure. Thanks for having me, Chris. So my name is Casey Callison. Um, from Wisconsin, went to school up there, but currently working with the Toronto Blue Jays organization. Um, kind of going back a little bit of my come up and how I kind of got to this position. Uh, did undergrad University of Wisconsin lacrosse. Uh, worked there for probably about like three years. Um, after that, did grad school, some grad school at UW-Madison. Uh, in between there, did some internships between uh, like the Mayo Clinic, private sector, and then eventually I got the opportunity with the Toronto Blue Jays. And now I'm entering into my sixth season. I uh, worked everywhere kind of from rookie ball for a little bit, um, low A, and then now I'm up in double A uh, for the past two years I've been there. So that's kind of like my story so far. So you got right into pro ball with the Blue Jays, no other organizations or anything, right? Yeah, and uh, I I definitely got pretty lucky with it because at that time we had had, I think it was like three or four guys that had gone to uh, the University of Wisconsin lacrosse as well, too. So it's like we kind of had this Wisconsin pool that we were pulling from. But yeah, I I got I got really lucky. I was fortunate. They reached out and they're like, hey, like give an application in and we'll consider you. And it's kind of been history ever since. Are you in Wisconsin in the off seasons or are you somewhere warm? Not, not anymore. I'm in a warmer spot, North Carolina. A lot of my family has actually moved out of Wisconsin for that exact reason, is because it's uh, it's pretty cold up there. Yeah, I've never been, but I have heard it's it's pretty chilly. I mean, coming from Buffalo, I know the cold, but it's yeah, Ooh. it might even be another level of cold up there. So, um, so you've been in with the Blue Jays six. You're going into six years now. I'm sure you have some good stories, but what is your best professional baseball story so far? Um, there's there's definitely a lot of them, but. Probably one of my more like funny and enjoyable ones was during my first year, 2018 extended spring training. Um, Spring training in and of itself is just kind of like crazy to take in, especially like for your first time. But when you get to extend it, it's to like a whole nother level because you've got a ton of young guys there. And then plus there's a bit of the language barrier. So it's a lot of rookies um, with just a jam packed schedule. So uh, during that first year at the complex, we're trying to organize conditioning. And there was just something with the schedule that day that got messed up. So we're sitting there and it's like me and two other guys were like, all right, like, what are we going to do? We got to get these guys going, you know, whatever game plan. One of them ends up grabbing one of the Gators at the facility. And we're just sitting there and like carting guys from like field to field. It's like, all right, we got to get this done. And it was just so funny because all, all the young guys loved it as well, too. But it just it was so comical that like one guy would get back. He'd be like, all right, like who do we got to get off the list. All right, this guy and this guy. And then he'd go and he'd go to field two, see where the guy was at. But uh, it was just, it was funny during the time, but kind of also explains like what the job is like, where it's, you know, things aren't always going to go as planned and you just got to like on the go, like, okay, what can we do to make this still work? So, but it was, it was funny during that time. You're like, what is going on? Yeah. I would think the two lessons, just listening to you speak there, one, like you said, is having a plan, but having to adjust. And then the other is like strength coaches. I've I've been saying this lately is like, we're uh, solutions finders, not problem creators. So like when a problem comes to us, it's our job to find it, even if it has nothing to do with strength and conditioning, right? Like, hey, these guys need to get to this field ASAP, figure it out for me. It's like, all right, let's get the gator and let's go, right? Like, yeah. hey, what time does uh, the anthem start? Like, it's not my job, but now I know every day I'll have the anthem time for you. You know, like our mm-hmm. job is almost like behind the scenes orchestrating of just making things run smoothly. And everybody's going to come to us at some point, whether it's you know, hitting coach, pitting, pitching coach, manager, players, athletic trainers, even like the clubhouse guys or the kitchen staff, like somebody's going to come to us with a question or, or some sort of issue that isn't necessarily strength and conditioning related. And we're like expected to just figure it out. And if we don't like, we don't have the answer immediately, like we need to figure it out for them. So it's, yeah, th- oh, yeah. there is a sneaky good lesson or two in that one for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, how about just like crazy beliefs what do you believe in within strength and conditioning that others think you're crazy for believing sure um and this is a good question too this one really made me think um and i actually i talked with tommy a little bit i was like hey man like what what was crazy for you um but i'd say for me is 
for me, it's kind of like question everything in the sense of not that you don't believe or trust in it, but just to like further your understanding of it. Um, I love to just be a student of s &C, just so many things out there. I love to learn. So I think that's something that uh, my coworkers think I'm a little bit crazy for at times is because some of the questions that I'll just come at them with and just kind of like seems like it's from way out there. But uh, it's really just because, you know, whether I'm reading things current in SNC, if it's something for maybe it's more of like the uh, like a mentality thing, like maybe Jocko, or maybe it's even something from a history book or like personal finance. It's just trying to like bridge some of these gaps on things and seeing if things apply over. But uh, I would definitely say I'm probably one of the more inquisitive guys on staff, um, just because it is, it's like trying to figure out like, what can we do to perfect our program to bring a World Series back to Toronto? Because that's, that's our mantra, so. Okay, two things. One, what did Tommy tell you he thought was crazy? Do you remember what he said? Sure, yeah. So his big thing was just kind of like focusing on the basics of being a good person, um, kind of like showing that you care, especially when there's a lot of things out there that we feel like with an s &C that we have to be discovering like all these new things or you have to be great at this great at that when realistically a lot of it's right in front of you and it's like hey like just show up on time show people you care do the do the very simple things that quite honestly aren't even necessarily require an snc background just like be a good person yeah shout out to tommy man he's solid <laughs> yeah. he's gonna have yeah. a really good future in this game and then the other thing you talk about being inquisitive I, this is something i've pondered on myself do you think that's like a natural thing to you or do you think that's something that's developed over time and then like an extension of that is do you think people can develop an inquisitive mindset i i think for me it's a bit natural um because i feel like that was just something for me it was always i wanted to know why you know whether if i was a kid and mom and dad were telling you something that you just didn't understand just seeking to understand that but at the same time i do feel like that's something that you can develop though so long as a person has some type of passion or drive behind that, right? Like if they don't care about the subject or whatever it might be, they're probably not going to ask nearly as many questions. But I do think it's kind of one of those things like as you're learning new things, um, you're probably going to unlock a lot more questions than answers. And again, so long as you're really interested with that, I, I do feel pretty firmly that that can be something that's developed. Yeah, I would agree. I, I feel like just kind of reflecting on my own life and my own path, like, I've always been a relatively inquisitive person just about anything. And I think the, the key point for you is like, if somebody isn't as inquisitive, like finding something that they are really passionate about helps you just kind of develop like that inquisition towards that. And then maybe that transfers to something else. Like you're talking about, yeah. you know, you read Jocko, you read personal finance stuff. Like I, I was always really inquisitive when I was young about strength and conditioning and it was just all X's and O's. And then as I got a really good base of that, it was like, all right, there's a sub branch of this to dig into. And then I get into that and I'm like, oh, this is kind of interesting. And then it leads me into this other rabbit hole. And then now I have like three or four books going at any one time on like, you know, movement training and leadership and like for fun book. And like somehow they all kind of like intertwine at the point of my life that I'm at. But I think it started with just, having a passion for one thing and then letting that naturally branch out the way that you're yeah. kind of talking about. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So it's, it's always interesting to talk to people that, that are just like na naturally inquisitive. Like when I, I was a kid, I hated reading. I hated like, I just loved sports, you know, like every, yeah, <laughs> every kid. And then I got into weightlifting and then it was like, I actually really love weightlifting. Like, but I, I need to figure out how this makes me a better player, not just a bodybuilder and like looking better. And then I figured that out. And then it's like, wait a minute, strength and conditioning is like a whole like field. Like this is wide open for me now. And then now it's like every day it's like, oh, you know, I can listen to this podcast. I can watch this YouTube video. I can talk to this strength coach. Like there's endless resources on strength and conditioning. And now it's almost to the point where it's like, how do I connect these other things like you're talking about to my strength and conditioning life so that I'm a well-rounded person and not just <laughs> yeah. a walking textbook of strength and conditioning, you know? Yeah, no, I, I agree, man. I think back to like classes that I took back in school and I by no, no means was like a phenomenal uh, student, but it's like, now I look back and I'm like, man, I wish I would have taken that. Or it's like, you know, I, I never took physics back in school. So I was like, man, I wish I would have taken physics. I took chemistry instead. But uh, yeah, it's just kind of interesting. Once you find that true passion that you have on something, then you start like, slowly getting into other pieces and you're like wow like some of this stuff is actually pretty related and then again you find out how many more rabbit holes you can go down 
Yeah, I almost wish I could like go back to school and like take the classes I did early on in my career, knowing what I know now and just seeing how they would like hit me differently. Like I, I sure. do that with books a lot. Like I have kind of a set of books that I always go back and read each year or every two years. And like every time I do, I'm a year or two smarter or I guess wiser. Um, and so things kind of pop out at me differently in, the, in those books where like they might not have registered the first time, but mm -hmm. now they do. Um, I, I was always curious about just I wonder how that would be if I if I was able to go back to school if I would still like kind of pay attention kind of not pay attention or like if it was like oh okay now I see how that could work 10 years down the road type of sure thing. so uh, okay so let's talk about success you were the strength and condition coach of the year in the Eastern League this year uh, we are going to have a group podcast I don't know if it'll come out before or after this episode just discussing that but First and foremost, obviously, congrats to you on that. It's an awesome award. It's peer voted and, and obviously you're doing something right. So I want to know what it is that you think makes a strength and condition coach successful at an affiliate and then maybe specifically just in general. Sure. Uh, and, and thanks. I appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> I, I personally feel like first and foremost, similar to what Tommy said, again, he answered it with a different question. But um, I, I think it's you just have to show, again, people that you care. The S&C stuff for me just it come secondary in the sense that I just, whoever I'm working with, whether it's player, whether it's staff member, or even if it's somebody at the affiliate that's not directly affiliated with the organization, it's just get to know them and just be a good person. Like enjoy the time that you're gonna have with them because at the end of the day, the season's really long. Uh, you're around them more than you are your family. So it's just like show the people around you that you care. Um, and then kind of getting in like specific to coaching, for me, it's really just being able to look at kind of like the macro and the micro macro being like, okay, like, you know, I finished this year, 2022. These are the things that I learned. These are the things that I could do better, but uh, reflect on that stuff and kind of have the, the big picture ready to go for the next season. And then from the micro lens or like a smaller lens is kind of chunking it and realizing like, okay, I know right now I'm running off season camps with guys and that's going to be heavy goal process orientated um, where we can really attack it from an SNC standpoint. But then I also know too that once spring training rolls around or right after Christmas, the new year is then things are going to start ramping. Guys are going to start showing up. So just again, like no, like we'll do for periodization anyways, just know what your year is going to look like and plan accordingly. And that even still in and of itself is a pretty like zoomed out view um, of what success would look like for an affiliate strength and conditioning coach. So you talk about uh, like reflecting on the, the year that you had, what are you like looking to get into more for this coming year or um, just like, what do you think you can do better or just different? Like um, as you reflect on the year that that was. Sure. Um, I always know <clears throat> I can always become better as being a coach uh, just with learning more of like different, um, different screens, assessments, different exercises, uh, progressions, regressions for movements. Um, whether it's mobility or adjusting different strength parameters based on like injury history. Um, so that's always like, that's my foundation is I'm always going to be working on that, but something that um, is kind of like a side project, if you will, um, just very, very interested within workload management within guys um, to provide like an example is if you look at some of our young guys, whether they're uh, first year just got drafted or maybe some of our young guys down in the Dominican summer league or in the fall, um, Fall of the, ah, not fall, sorry, Florida Development League, League, I believe is what we call it. It used to be called the Florida Coast League when I was there. But anyways, you've got these really young guys, and then you have major league players. Clearly, we have a massive gap there. So it's being able to dive in and see anything from player load to throwing load to swing load to, to sprint load, but just working on to establish a better understanding and idea of what some of these parameters are for a player's development process through our system. Um, Again, it's not to say that we don't have something like that, but it's more so just digging into it more and really getting an idea of like, if I've got a guy, let's say a double A and he's got to go up to triple A and then also probably be needed in the big leagues. Um, I mean, you're close there, but at the same time, he could have totally different workload demands going from double A where maybe he's playing every day. It's up in the big leagues. It's like, hey, we want to get him some experience up there. Maybe we do get him in for like an inning or for a game. Um, but still though, at the same time, it's like, totally different group of athletes that a guy's playing with um, and even like prospect pool too. So I feel like if we can really iron out that process of what some of those parameters and ranges look like for guys, uh, I, I just think that'd be an awesome thing um, to just help making sure that our guys are ready to go and at their best each and every day.
best they can I wanna, be. I want to run with this a little bit. Are you okay with, with talking about yeah, blood management sure. stuff? Okay, yeah. so you talk about like position players moving up and then obviously the, the other side of that is pitchers, right? So from my own personal experience, and I'm curious if you've seen the same, is like position players that usually move up that are like your your cream of the crop, your your top level <laughs> prospect guys, or even like mid tier guys, whatever, however it is, but like they seem to play more in the minor leagues than when they come up to the big leagues, right? Unless they're like the, the top of the top and they're going to play every day type. Yeah. Where the pitchers, I've almost, I have seen the opposite, right? Is like, we have a guy who maybe he's a closer in double A AA or triple A, you know, he kind of mm -hmm. knows his pitching schedule and then he comes to the big leagues and he gets thrown into the fire right away. He goes five out of eight days. He throws multiple innings. Um, even like when I was in triple A, ninth in 2019 like we had a guy who was a starter with us and then he had to go up and be a reliever with them and then kind of come back and be a starter so it's like it seems like position players when they move up play less and then pitchers when they move up get used more have you seen that yourself yeah I would I would definitely say so um that seems to be pretty true for us I mean we had like some guys that I mean after I guess like their first year kind of uh like then they really got thrown into the mix just because then they kind of reformulate the roster but yeah generally speaking for us that's very much so the same do you think that um like as they move up is there ways to kind of mitigate or minimize those big spikes of like okay the again it, we can't control like when a guy plays in a game or like when a guy pitches in a game or whatever but as they move up or down like what kind of stuff have you seen help, if any, um, just kind of minimize those big spikes? Sure. <clears throat> um, I think the easiest thing is just kind of checking for awareness or like soundness of a guy's routine and like just posing the question to him and saying like, hey, man, like you've got some great opportunities here. Um, but just what what do you think we're going to need to do if you're not playing nearly as much because you're, uh, you know, you're playing every game of the week for us right now. So that's what I like to touch on first, just to see like if a guy would have the autonomy to be able to make those adjustments and just kind of see where their head would go. But I do think is again, um, I've had a lot of success with guys and just being able to show some of our graphs, some of our systems to them and just fill them in and say, Hey, look, man, like I'm tracking top speeds for you. I'm also tracking how many times you're going out and taking ground balls, this and that. Um, this is where your numbers are currently at. And if you fall below this, like, you know, hey, you're probably looking at more of an increased risk of injury if it all of a sudden like drives right back up. So I think any type of visual representation of some of the data that's easy for a player to digest or like quick hit, quick, quick hits along the way, I feel like that can pay a lot of dividends down the line because at the end of the day, baseball, like there's so many different stats that we're taking. I think if we can really relate that to them and figure out like what sticks with them, because they're also not strength and conditioning coaches, they're baseball players. So if we can figure out a good way to do that, to at least have them be aware of that. Uh, Cause that, I mean, that's another thing. I mean, they may go from double A, triple A and into the bigs. And for us, that's four different strength coaches that you're working with. And each of them might be a little bit different, but just so that way, like they have their foundation. I got kind of long winded with that, but that's, that's where I would start with it. No, that's uh, honestly, that's perfect. I, I would agree. I think the, especially the more they move up, there's more information available to them and given to them. And for us to make our, like our point, uh, like heard and understood, I think, like you said, one, having an easy visual for them two like having the good conversations with them. And then three, like making the, the long-term effects of either doing this or not doing this, like very easily digestible. I think that all helps. Um, and for me, for me, I think you were spot on. I, it, it's not long winded or anything. I'm, I think that's like relevant. And the thing is, like you said, those, as guys move up they're they're going to work with different strength coaches. Uh, and for me, I always try to tell our guys like the, when a guy moves up, you shouldn't be making the person mm -hmm. above you, above you, their job harder. It should be easier for them. Yeah. That guy should yeah. come up to you. He should have an understanding of what he's doing. Strength and conditioning wise, have a decent routine, if not a great routine, um, and the volume of your training at your level should theoretically be higher than the next level. Um, we shouldn't have a guy who, you know, under trains in double A and then he comes up to triple A and he's expected to do even more because then you're adding more stress to his plate. And especially mm -hmm. when they make that jump to the big leagues, there's the media, there's meetings, there's just the stress of playing in major league games. It's, it's something this year that I took a, a, a I took, 
like on myself to do. We had a lot of guys moving up and down from AAA and just interacting with them when they first got there and just having those conversations of like, hey, what does your routine look like? I'm here to help you. If you start feeling fatigued, like we need to make adjustments, but you need to communicate with me. We need to talk. Yeah. And and all of them, or I should say a large majority of those guys were like, man, the, the minor leagues, no matter what you do, isn't going to prepare you for the big leagues. And especially playing in the American League East mm -hmm. and just yeah. playing in Boston with the crowd and the intensity. It's just, it's just another level. And so for us, like, I think even if we do everything right in the minor leagues, like there's still that added effect of like now, oh, like, oh shit, I'm in the big leagues now. Like the lights are just so, that much brighter. And like, oh, yeah. for, for me, a huge part of it was just communicating with those guys and like checking in every day, like, like even mentally, like, Hey, are you all right? Like you doing okay. Do you need anything? Like, and I think that went a long way for me, one for buy-in from, from them for our program, but two, just helping them feel like, more at home and more comfortable and more relaxed and like knowing they had somebody on their side and in their corner to talk to about things like dude i'm gassed like can you help me out like yes i, I can like or hey you know i i know you were kind of protected in the minor leagues but like we take the kid gloves off here like it, you're gonna get worked like be ready for it like maybe we should do a little less to start and then you can see how how the workload goes and then we can adjust so I think for me, yeah. the biggest thing was just having those conversations, just being on the opposite side of like the minor league guys going to the big leagues, right? It's just, there's always that that added intensity of the game that you can never replicate in, in the minor leagues, no matter how hard you try. Yeah, so. yeah. It, it's funny you mentioned like playing in Boston too. There's multiple uh, guys that um, I've worked with from our like major league roster that have just said like, it's, it's totally different playing there. Like just the intensity, everything they're like, so some of them are like, I don't like playing there at all. Like the fans, they just bring it. And so just funny. Yeah, man. It's it, the American League East is a real thing, you know, between Toronto's very loud, New York's very loud, uh, Boston's very loud. And then you got the turf down in Tampa and in Toronto. Like it's all of these elements factor into yep. just making the game that much more difficult for these guys. And again, in the, in the minor leagues, better or worse, like every week they have an off day the travel's gotten a little bit easier. Like it's all of that stuff doesn't help make that transition any easier yeah. for those guys. And then they get up there and again, like the lights are bright and they're like, Whoa, like I just scored the winning run against the Yankees in the, in the bottom of the ninth, we walked it off. Like, yeah, I don't remember what happened. And it's like, but then they're like, you know <laughs> yeah. what I mean? Like they, they're exhausted and it's like, how can we help them to minimize? Like we were talking about those big spikes in intensity and just, Mm -hmm. minimize the risk of, of soft tissue injury. Cause I think a lot of that happens with those guys is just those big spikes and workload. Mm -hmm. Where are you going for uh, resources specifically? Are you reading anything? Or are you just like diving in more to your own internal processes that you guys use? Um, I, I'd say it's, it, well, it's kind of all over the place. I haven't read a like targeted S and C book in a while, but that's also because I'm much more of like an article or podcast guy. So it's more so like as concepts kind of come around, it's like, boom, hit it up. Um, I, I know like a website I frequent is uh, Science for Sport. I just, I like a lot of their content that they have um, because it tends to be a lot of the things that I'm interested in. But uh, anything from like, what did we do last year? Last year we had an FMS seminar. Um, actually tomorrow we're heading down to the Florida State Clinic uh, to hear some seminars there. We just had, uh, oh man, I forget his first name. Um, but his, uh, his name is Nunzio. We had him from Jersey. So like we always have a lot of things kind of come to us, um, whether it be speakers, presentations, things of that nature. So that's good there. And then for myself, for books, um, again, like I said, anything from Jocko. I do like some from Tim Ferriss as well, too. A very interesting one that I like of his is Tools of Titans, where he just interviews like a ton of like hyper successful people or that like, you know, society would claim is hyper successful. But just see, like, some of their routines, what do they do, right? Like, some of these guys are sitting there, waking up at 4 o'clock in the morning, starting their day off with, like, a run or something like that. Or maybe it's just, like, there's certain things that they do. But I, what I enjoy about it is it gives me an opportunity to reflect, okay, like, these are what some other people are doing that have basically found a lot of success in their specific field. How can I apply that over to what I'm doing? Again, time parameters might be different, but really enjoy that. How about... Um maybe like specifically to the workload stuff. Um, like do you, is it's hard. Cause I don't know if there's any like actual legitimate resources on that, or if it's just like, 
mastering your own like hey these are the the, the things we do like this is yeah. what we really want to hammer with you guys like how do we refine this or is it like hey i read this like let's try to pull this in like you know maybe sure. catapult or something like that for instance sure um yeah catapult we use that that's helpful um but honestly something that i've really found a lot of use with is I've been interested again in some personal finance stuff and just kind of like reading into like, okay, like what are some of these moving averages that are used for people when you're investing? Um, what are some of these Bollinger bands? Like there's people out there, these mathematicians, statisticians that uh, they apply this to making money as well too. But the thing is though, it kind of gives you an idea of parameter and zones to kind of follow. So that's been something again, not directly within S and C, but for me, it's just been a combination of that um, re refining my knowledge of Excel as well, too. Uh, I should say like, we do have some in-house systems that we have that we've had, you know, IT people that are way smarter than myself, um, that develop that. But at the same time though, I've really enjoyed going out there and seeing different ways that you can back test data from like, let's say a CSV file. So it's again, kind of like non-traditional in the sense that I'm not going out there and getting workload book, but it's trying to go out there and see what, what are other people using as assessment tools to monitor trends out there just numerically and then going into the data that we have and trying to see like what I can have. So like one thing right now that I'm taking a peek at is we use our Hawkins dynamics force plates and it's just getting an idea of where again, like some of these guys are trending in season. Maybe there's a guy that comes out of rehab and as soon as he gets into the affiliate life, all of a sudden his jumps are just going down. So it's like, all right, like I see this trend. Let me go back and take some, or take a peek at like what I was noticing or like what his training look like. So it's really just kind of taking what's in front of me um, and also just trying to take everything in uh, just to kind of see like what things stick. So granted that can take some time because it can be resource intensive of getting all the data in front of you, finding the right data, finding some type of correlation, speaking with um, like your research and development team as well too. I've sent emails out to them just to kind of bounce questions off of them. So um, I would say it's just exhausting all the resources that I have to see what kind of sticks or see what at least creates conversation with other people um, to get us thinking. Yeah, I have two things there. One, I, I really enjoy when something non-strength and conditioning like makes its way into relevance for my actual job as a strength coach. Like if I read, even if I read like, I don't know, a murder mystery book and like something in there like sure. kind of clicks for me in strength and conditioning and I think I, I do really well with like making stories or like, you know, analogies or something like to compare something to strength and conditioning. And so like when something from the outside makes sense to me and I can relate it to my job, like I, I, it's an awesome win for me because then I don't have to go to the guy and be like, you know, the squat does this for this, this, this. It's like, imagine if yeah. you think about this and then you transition it to this and they're like, Oh, okay. Okay. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. So like the, the, the finance principles for me, I think is really cool. And like, just a different way to look at, you know, sifting through data and finding principles and processes that work. And then the other thing you talk about is like looking back on your data and actually auditing it and like using it to find correlations or, or causations or however you want to look at it. It's like, I think right now in general, baseball is in this weird, like just collect, 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 collect data. Yeah. And like, sometimes that data just sits on the back burner and like collects dust and like we just collect for the sake of collecting and like having it um and the same goes with programs and everything too like i i think you have to take an active approach to like looking back reflecting and like figuring things out and, and honestly like if you're collecting the data you're not using it for anything like it, it's not going to get buy-in from players and, and mm -hmm. honestly you can probably cut it out i'd rather have like two or three things that we really dive deep into we really have a refined process for instead of like 20 different things and then we don't actually know which one is causing you know positive or negative changes for guys mm -hmm. so, yeah just my own two cents i guess <laughs> no i like it and it, it, it makes sense because it's like you know how's the saying going it's like if it's if it's important like track it um, and even if something might be important, again, you could track it one way and maybe you figure out, you go back and it's part of the learning process, but you look and you're like, all right, like there, I thought it was important, but clearly it's not because right now I'm seeing like zero correlation within this right now, or it's not seeming to be relevant. Um, and at times, like that's just part of the process that we have to go through because at the end of the day, it's, I guess it's just part of growing. It's part of learning. It's not, it's not a quick thing. Right. 
So we talked about just showing people that we care and, you know, planning and just auditing and reflecting on things. Do you have any other mm -hmm. advice for uh, coaches in the field, either young coaches looking to get in or just older coaches trying to stay on top of things? Yeah, um, I would say, and I'm, I'm probably bad at this. I always say like, I want to do it and I, I need to be better at it, but I would say as well, just reaching out to coaches in the field and just checking out for like shadowing opportunities. I remember that was a big thing for me getting into my, uh, program back in undergrad uh was just like you know you have to get shadow hours and I think it's just good to go out there and get an idea of how a different realm may do things again go back to a private sector and take a peek and see how different performance uh institutes do that maybe it's even going to like a PT setting if you want to get a little bit more on the rehab side um and then obviously we have college as well too and if there's other professional sport teams that you have um you know connections with do that but that's uh I, I think about this and I talk to the Blue Jay guys about it, but it's like, you know, we'll get really good and we're very in tune with what we do with the Toronto Blue Jays, but there's so many other great ways to do things out there. It's like, we're not doing it like the way, like the absolute right way. It works for us because that's what we built our system on. But I would say it's just very, very important. Um, no matter where we're at in our careers, just, just go out and learn from other people. Just go out there, connect and see if you're able to follow along and kind of see what their work looks like and obviously engage in conversation. Yeah, this, this podcast has been like a, a blessing for me just to be able to have a reason to reach out to people. I think sure. it's it's a weird thing, right, to just like cold call or reach out to somebody and be like, hey, can I come <laughs> check out your work? Or hey, do you have yeah. time to talk? Like, it's uncomfortable for us. But at the same time, like, I, I think most coaches are, are genuine and, and will absolutely let you in. Or even like, if you can't go visit them, just talk shop. And then Mm -hmm. The other part of that, that, you know, you talk about different realms and different ways of doing things. I think when you do that, I think too many people reach out to like people that have the same beliefs or the like, I'm a West side guy. So I'm going to go to sure. West side and see how they do it. Like, I, I, I think it's almost better if sometimes you reach out to the exact opposite. Like this guy believes in things that I'm, I'm strongly against. Let me see why he believes in this, or let me see why she believes in that or and then challenge yourself, like challenge your own beliefs. You talked about it earlier, like questioning everything and just like, you know, you, I, you have to have some sort of principles that you stand on, but at the same time, yeah. like you shouldn't be afraid to question those or question anything that you do. And if it's going to make you a better coach, like you should do it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's like counterintuitive at first, but when you think about it, like it just makes sense. Like you should probably challenge your own beliefs more than uh, like just reaffirming your own biases. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So um, it's been really good talking with you, man. And, and I don't want to keep you too long, but uh, how do you feel about a lightning round? Just four questions, long or short as you want. And yeah. then, uh, we'll get you out of here. I promise. Yeah. Hit me. No worries. All right. First one, who is your biggest influence in the field of strength and condition? Uh, for me, it's <clears throat> uh, Kevin Schultz. He's up at the university of Wisconsin, Madison. I, uh, I met Kevin in my undergrad and he was kind of like the first strength coach that I met with in the college setting. And it just was like, Everything that the guy did, granted, when I was young, um, with him being the head there, the guy was so busy. So I was constantly working with other like interns and undergrad, and it was um, grad students as well, too. <clears throat> but eventually, life kind of slowed down for him, though, where I could kind of like ask more questions of him. But it's just the guy, like, again, common theme, like just cared about the people he was around. But <clears throat> he just would seriously be, again, exploring these like really outside concepts on things. And I think part of it was coming from a Division three setting that you have to get creative because it's like, you don't have much funds available there. So I remember a couple of things that he was looking into. It's like, we eventually got um, like, we got like blue lights in the weight room. Um, Cause he's kind of looking through like different like spectrums of lighting, how it was like blue is supposed to promote like more serotonin or dopamine or something like that. And red was supposed to be more of like a recovery. So it's like, he's experimenting with things like that. He's reaching out to people, seeing if it's valid, um, like within our like science department. So um, it's just the guy, like he just, he leveraged everything. He was a great guy. And um, yeah, he just really influenced me. And I, I keep in touch with him. And I'm thankful because a lot of my career is like owed to that dude because he got me going. The D3 setting is like a great place to grow because you oh, have to stretch mm -hmm. everything as far mm -hmm. as you can and get creative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, if you only had one piece of equipment to train with, what would it be? Um, I feel like it's got to be a barbell. And I say that because that was the first thing I bought when everything shut down for COVID. I remember going on Rogue Fitness just because I feel like they've got some pretty good deals. 
and I'm on there like browsing and seeing like everything was sold out. And then all of a sudden one day I saw, <clears throat> I saw there's a, a barbell available. I was like, perfect. First thing I'm going to get barbell. And then later on, I got some weights with it, but you can just do so much with the barbell. So I feel like that's what it's got to be. I had a home gym before the COVID shutdown, but I really wanted a rogue bar and they were out for everything. And I just kept checking the boneyard every day, every day I had notifications and then they yeah. sent me one and I was like, I'm pulling the trigger right now and not even thinking twice. And then it took forever for them to ship it. And then it was sitting in, in uh, the UPS. And then finally sure. I got it. It was like the happiest day of, mm -hmm. of the shutdown for me, but totally, yeah, totally understand. Totally understand. Uh, what is your biggest accomplishment professionally and or personally? Oh, geez. Um, <clears throat> I feel like this one's tough. Uh, looking back, I think, I think something for me, like what's been a good, like learning experience with this is when I was young, I, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, didn't really like school. I just enjoyed hanging out with my buddies. I loved doing sports. And uh, eventually got to a point where in high school, my mom and dad were like, Hey, like you're going to college, no matter what, whether you like it or not. And I'm like, okay, I guess I got to get serious about some of this stuff. So I was running track and field at the time. And I just, I asked my track coach, I was like, Hey, what, um, like, what did you go to school for? How, how are you able to be a coach? And he told me basically exercise, sports science, uh, things of that nature. So then I kind of started taking things seriously. And I remember my, my goals and aspirations at that point, I was like, Hey, like I really want to work for, um, to be able to have experience working with and working for a professional team. I just, I think that'd be awesome. And, um, I, I kind of biased as well too, coming from Wisconsin, a big thing for me was the Wisconsin Badgers. And then also the, uh, of course the Packers, <laughs> the Cheesehead. So, um, I, I was super lucky. I got internship and I was able to go to school at uh, Wisconsin. So I checked that off. Um, through a buddy of mine, I was able to get the strength and conditioning coach for the Packers, uh, I believe Mark Lavat. I got his uh, email and I was able to kind of reach out to him. I never got a chance to actually like work with them, but he, he was a great guy because he always responded. You know, sometimes you go out there and it's uh, like applying for internships, graduate assistantships, or even a job. And uh, you send out a, a hundred to like thousands of applications and you never hear back. And that guy literally would be like within 24 hours and you just say, hey, I appreciate it. Um, appreciate you reaching out, but we don't have anything. Um, lo and behold, after several years of just continually bugging him, um, he gave me a call and kind of gave me some positive words for encouragement, but eventually ended up having me up to Lambeau and we just kind of talked some shop. So granted, I didn't get to work with them, but that was just, that was huge for me because that was just like the hometown team. And again, just somebody reaching out and like showing that they cared to like help me in my career. And then lastly, um, again, fortunate enough to be working with the Toronto Blue Jays. So really kind of everything up until this point has been like a massive accomplishment for me. And I'd say kind of wrecking, recommending out to a question we had earlier for younger uh, strength coaches out there. It's just kind of like, like just shoot, shoot for the stars and even then some, because I, I found myself again with these opportunities and I'm sitting here and I'm like, wow, like I'm not even 30 and I've been able to knock a lot of these things out. Like I need to think of some other things that I want to do. So um, it's just everything so far has been amazing to be able to get these opportunities. So it's been great, lucky, fortunate. Yeah, it's funny. Like when I, I flew home from Arizona after I got offered the, the uh, big league assistant here. And then as soon as I got in the car, my dad, the first thing he said was, all right, what's your next goal? Like you always have <laughs> yeah, goals. Like you do, you know, you're in the big leagues now what's next. And I was like, dad, I just got the job. And he's like, you got to set another goal for yourself, man. Keep going higher. And you know, yeah. that, that always sticks with me. And again, I, I feel the same, like just the exercise science thing. Like he had always pushed me like, Hey, you like working out? Like, why don't you just do this? I'm like, no, no, that's dumb. Like, that's not a real mm -hmm. thing. And then like, it, it became a real thing. And along the way you just meet like the right people and they give you the time. And it goes mm -hmm. back to what we were talking about. Like just mm -hmm. reach out to people. And, you know, even if somebody doesn't respond, like somebody will, that's going to influence you positively and just, and you're just going to remember it. Right. Like I, I remember all the people that when I reached out and I didn't have anything to my name, they were like gave me the time of day. And I'm like, that's awesome. And I, and I think in general, most of this field is like that. So if there's somebody that you feel you need to reach out to, or you need to talk to or learn from talk shop with, like, I say, just do it, man. I agree with you hundred percent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, last one, any career other than strength and conditioning, what would you choose? Um, it would, it would totally be like, I, I know I've said it multiple times on here, but like personal finance stuff, like investing in the stock market. Um, I just, I think it's cool. And, uh, I remember when I first kind of got full-time, and I was able to have some accounts to like basically plan for the future. 
I, uh, I was always kind of blown away where it's like, so wait, you're telling me I can give my money to somebody, they can manage it, but they can still like lose it. And I can be like out the money. So that was just something that kind of like piqued my interest. And I feel like it'd just be kind of cool to learn how like the global economy and just like how we afford things. Um, I feel like that'd be kind of cool. So that, that'd be my other career if I got into, uh, if I didn't do strength and conditioning. Gotcha. Well, Casey, it's been fun. It's been nice to get to know you over the, the couple episodes that we've recorded. If the listeners want to get in touch with you, where can we get more? Is social media the right place or is there a better spot? Uh, best spot for me, honestly, just email um, casey.callison at bluejays.com. That'll be the best way to get a hold of me. And again, like just anything and everything. Um, just, yeah, reach out. Don't be afraid to. Cool. Well, I appreciate your time, man. It, it, like I said, it's been awesome to get to know you and uh, looking forward to future conversations and we'll talk soon. Of course. Thanks, Chris. All right, everybody, that's going to conclude this episode with Casey. I hope you enjoyed this one. I think there's a lot of really good stuff to take from this episode, especially in regards to the workload management and dealing with players moving up and down in the system in professional baseball. Three things that I took from Casey in this episode. Question yourself and your beliefs to further your understanding of different topics. Reflect on your past to help you be a better coach in the future. And learning from other disciplines can sometimes help you to connect the dots in your current position. With that being said, I hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll talk to you again on the next one.